Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Warnersburg service. We're so glad you're joining with us. My name is Ryan Terramoto. I'm on staff here. And I just want to tell you a few things that are going on. If you're a member of Winnersburg, if you are receiving our emails, uh, we just want to remind you that there's a survey on there, and that survey will close tomorrow night. So please, please uh, respond to that survey, talking about questions about res responding to our reopening. This Sunday, Pastor Fred will be giving the last message of our series, Exiles, a study in 1 Peter. Next week, we'll be getting a new series called Knowing God. And we'll be talking about how God's attributes, how uh, knowing that he is just, knowing that he is a loving God, how can we respond to, to that? And grasping God's attributes, how can we respond in today's climate? Well, today's call of worship, I'll be reading uh, Isaiah 25, verse 1. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for another amazing morning. Lord, you are a good God and a loving God. We thank you, you have given us this platform to worship together as a body of Winnersburg. Lord, we continue to pray for those who are hurting in our church, hurting nationwide, hurting uh, uh, physically, spiritually, or socially, Lord God. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be working amidst their lives. We ask that you will be using us as well to be supporting our body. Thank you for the gospel message. Thank you for the message that we are saved by grace and not by works. Lord, I pray that through this message, through today's Sunday service, through the worship, through the uh, word, uh, that you will be glorified. Thank you, Lord God, for this time of worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 so free and here I am knowing I'm a sinful man covered by the blood of the Lamb and now I the greatest love of all and it is mine since you laid down your life the greatest sacrifice Jesus found me 
just as I am Empty-handed but alive in your hands Singing majesty Majesty Forever I am changed by your of your majesty sing now I'm found and now I found the greatest love of all and it is mine since you laid down your life the greatest sacrifice now I found and now I found the greatest love of all and it is mine since you laid down your life the greatest sacrifice singing Your grace has found me just as I am Empty-handed but alive in your hands Singing majesty Majesty Forever I am changed by your love In the presence of your majesty Sing forever Forever I am changed by your love In the presence of your majesty Last time Forever I am changed by your love In the presence of your majesty Father, as we continue to worship you, God, and as we... Uh Sing one more song, but then also transition just to in, in, into a time of uh, worshiping you by studying your word, God. Um, this song, God, um, I know has played an inf influential part in my life, and um, it's just taught me that, uh, that worship is not about um, all the stuff and all the fluff, um, but worship is about you, and it's all about you, and it's only about you. And so um, as we sing this song, God, may we be reminded um, of that message. God, may we be reminded that, that a heart of worship is not a, uh, someone that seeks after fame or someone that uh, seeks after uh, more than that they think uh, more than you could provide. And so as we sing this song, God, uh, would you remind us of that, God, that, that our hearts would be holy and fully uh, worshipped, worshipping you. Search much deeper within 
King of endless worth No one could express How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you. It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Good morning, Wittersburg. It's a joy to be with you this morning. Joy to share God's word with you. 1 Peter 5. 8 to 14. And as T mentioned, this is the last sermon in the book of First Peter that we will be sharing with you. Winston Churchill said this, attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. You know, I've noticed uh, my daughter's kids, sometimes they get into trouble. And my daughter or uh, their husbands will say something like, say I'm sorry. Well, the grandkids will often say, I'm sorry. And usually my daughter will admonish them and say, no, not like that, with the right attitude. Okay, I'm sorry. No, that's still not good enough. From my daughter and, and, her, and their husbands, the attitude of my grandkids' hearts as they say these words really matter. Attitude matters. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Koine Greek, that's the language used by the writers of the New Testament, is different from English. One way it's different is the usage of verbs. Let me explain. In English, let's say you hear or read the words, go run. Well, if you see those words, go run, you might start running. Then again, you might not. You really need the context, right, to a phrase like, go run. For instance, if a buddy that you're hanging out with, your buddy's sipping a beverage, and he tells you, go run, that's really different from being a soldier in the battlefield and your sergeant says, go run. One is an order, a command. The other is an idea, 
a thought. Well, in the Koine Greek, you can tell the difference of whether it's a suggestion, an idea, a concept, or a command by the spelling of the verb. You don't have to know or hear the context to make that distinction. We know from reading the Greek in 1 Peter that in these verses, in verses 8 to 9, the things that he says are not suggestions. They're not ideas. They're not concepts. But they're commands. Let's go over them. First, Peter says to the Christians, be sober-minded. The command is be sober-minded. Well, sober-minded is the English translation of the Greek word nipho. It means being in control of one's urges, being disciplined enough to refrain from doing things that are ungodly and doing the right thing. I used to work with this uh, person, brilliant guy. He uh, accomplished a lot. And he was very disciplined. When he studied, he would really study. I mean, he would study for hours, do research. But when he had a little too much to drink, oh my goodness, he became a different person entirely. And I was shocked at what I would see and what I would hear from that person. Well, Peter is commanding Christians to avoid being intoxicated, not just by alcohol, but being intoxicated with the many allures of life. Another example, I've known people who've done crazy things because they would be focused and then something would catch their attention and they would divert their focus. And all of a sudden, they would lose self-control, discipline, and they would commit things that are just unconscionable. Well, Peter here is issuing the command, be sober-minded. He also says, be watchful, be on the alert. Christians must have attitudes of being sober-minded and watchful. Why? Because Satan is roaming around to mess with us, to do us harm. Peter uses a very graphic illustration in describing Satan. Peter describes Satan as a roaring lion prowling about to devour. That's pretty graphic. How does Satan seek to devour Christians? Let me share with you a few. It could be a direct attack. For instance, Job in the Old Testament. Remember, Satan got permission from God to afflict Job. And Job came down with all kinds of stuff. That's a direct attack from Satan. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he describes a messenger of Satan sent to torment him, thorn in the flesh. So some Sometimes Satan will afflict us directly. One thing I should note, Satan often goes, hits us where we are most weak and most vulnerable. This is something that we need to keep in mind. Being sober-minded, being watchful, especially in areas we know we are weak in because those are the areas that Satan will attack us. Think about the attack on Jesus. When Satan tempted Jesus, it was after Jesus had not eaten for 40 days. He was weary. He was tired. And Satan tempted Jesus with food, 
power, authority, and status. That's how Satan works. Satan also attacks human relationships. One of the areas or relationships that Satan attacks so violently and so viciously is in the marriage relationship. Brothers and sisters, I have seen too many marriages where Satan will attack the marriage covenant between husband and wife. And when Satan attacks the marriage relationship, oftentimes those two Christians become impotent. They are so burdened by the problems in their marriage relationship that they're unable to worship God, glorify God, unable to serve him. Satan is very crafty. He knows this. He knows that marriage is a very vulnerable area for every Christian couple. He also attacks other human relationships between a parent and a child. I've known Christian parents. Their countenance just changes when they're encountered with a relationship with their children that's toxic, dysfunctional. Satan knows our vulnerabilities. Satan also attacks the local church. Satan is able to seed just elements of distrust, contempt, disunity. I don't need to describe that. You've probably experienced that yourself. One of the terrible ways in which the church is afflicted is when we allow Satan to disrupt the unity we have in Christ. Against all these things, Christians must be sober-minded. Be on the alert. Peter goes on to say, resist him, firm in your faith. Well, what does that mean, firm in our faith? Well, Peter is commanding Christians, again, these are not suggestions, these are commands, to be resolute in standing firm in their faith in Christ. The Greek word translated firm means solid. That is, with respect to one's faith, the believer must be solid and immovable. Now, to understand the command to be firm in your faith, Peter is commanding Christians to have an attitude of being solid and immovable with respect to our faith and trust in the teaching of Scripture. Being solid and immovable, then, is not us whipping ourselves into a frenzy. Yes, I believe. I'm going to put my faith in Christ. It's not that. Firm in the faith means firm in terms of our heart attitude our trust, our dependency on the word of God, no matter what things might be happening in our lives. Let me give you an illustration from life. This was years ago when I was still an unbeliever and my brother was Christian and he and I would get into these debates. And to tell you the truth, I think I won those debates. My logic and my rhetoric was better than what he would present. But you know what? He always trumped me with one statement. He would say to me, Fred, I don't care what you say. I still believe in God. I believe in what the Bible teaches. I would get so frustrated. Come on, you can't do that. I got the best of you, man. But my brother's resolute trust in the word of God was so powerful, it just convicted me. And I began to realize, is there something I'm missing? That's what it means to be firm in your faith.
Peter also goes on to say that we're not alone in our suffering. We're experiencing suffering not just by ourselves, but by every brother and sister in Christ. Now, there are times when you're suffering, when, when you may feel like you're the only one suffering in the entire church or in entire Christendom, but that is not true. In fact, I would say that as American Christians, we've got it pretty cushy. And I, and I don't mean to marginalize those who are suffering, but if you really study in depth the suffering that other Christians endure throughout the world, man, we got it easy. Peter is reminding us that the suffering that we face, the suffering that we endure, the suffering that we just so painfully experience, we're not alone. Other brothers and sisters suffer with us. Being human, no one looks forward to suffering. Yet knowing that others are suffering, it can be a, a, a ray of hope, encouragement, right? We're not alone in this. Sometimes we wonder, why am I suffering and that other Christian isn't? Sometimes we feel that way, like, like we're the designated sufferer. Well, let me explain that dynamic. And, and I felt that at times, like, why am I getting all the trials and so-and-so seems to skate through life? Jesus, in fact, told Peter, Years before he wrote this epistle. Because Peter was wondering the same thing. When Jesus told Peter that he's going to suffer. And he's going to be a martyr, basically. Peter looked at John and said, what about that guy? What about him? And you know, remember what Jesus told Peter in John 21, 22? Jesus said, if it is my will that he, that's John, remain until I come, what is that to you? And then the next phrase is most important. Jesus told Peter, you follow me. So if we are ever in that position, doing the comparatives, why am I suffering and so and so, they're not. Forget that. Fix your eyes on Jesus and follow him. Verse 10, Jesus, or Peter said, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Your suffering is not the end. There is a, a purpose for our suffering. Through our suffering, God wants to restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us. Now, what does that mean? Well, restore. That means to bring to wholeness. I don't have to tell you, right? When we go through life, we experience more than bumps and bruises. Sometimes we're broken. And I don't mean just our physical bodies. We're broken through and through. There are times when I felt like giving up. Life is that hard. Well, God's purpose in our suffering is to restore us, bring to wholeness. God wants to confirm. This is to set fast, to encourage and support us. He wants to strengthen us through our suffering, to make us sturdy vessels to be used by God for his awesome, redemptive work in this fallen world. He wants to establish us through our suffering, to lay his foundation in us. That's what it means to establish us. Now, I want you to really meditate on that point. 
we're not establishing ourselves because we make so much money or that we attain that position or so many people report to us. Our foundation is established not by wealth, not by health, not by power, not by authority, not by even friendships or people who think we're good people. Our foundation is Christ himself in us. That's what it means for us to be established through our suffering. A friend of mine who's going through a terrible ordeal at this very time wrote me an email recently and I could almost feel his pain as he wrote to me. And he said, these words have really comforted him. And he said this, my life is not futile. My failures are not fatal. My death is not final. Brothers and sisters, remember this. Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, the one who resides in you, the one who will never leave you nor forsake you, the one who conquered the curse of death, is greater than any suffering you and I might experience in this world. Therefore, be encouraged. Be filled with hope. Verse 11. It's a very short phrase. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is a doxology. Words of praise. And you know what? When we read this, we might think, okay, let's move on to something that has more meaning and practical value. Don't do that. This is powerful stuff. It has so much practical relevance. Let me explain to you. When we worship God, it is the most fitting response to any suffering we might experience. I know the temptation is to kind of wallow in our misery, think about how bad we feel. I, I, I get that. I've been there. I know that. But may I suggest to you, no, may I command you, humbly that is, that when we're suffering, worship God. Offer praises unto him. It is the most powerful thing that we can do. When we worship God, our outlook changes. No, no longer is it just focused on the things that we face each and every day. Then, as we worship God, our attitude is transformed. The circumstances of life may not change, but when we worship God, we connect to Almighty God, the creator of all things, the ruler of all things, and we no longer have that dark sense that we're enslaved to our circumstances. In verses 12 to 14, Peter gives his final greetings and say, statements to the Christians who are suffering so greatly. Peter writes, By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. You know, I wish I could look inside Peter's mind as he wrote these final words. I'm just speculating, but I'm thinking, Here's Peter, knowing that the people he's writing to are suffering so terribly, so badly. He can't be there physically to encourage them. 
And so he's writing these words. And as he penned these final words, I don't think Peter was thinking, all right, I'm done with 1 Peter, on to 2 Peter. I don't think so. I believe as you read these final words, you see the depth and breadth of Peter's caring heart. Let me uh, clarify meaning of some of the terms in these verses. Babylon is a reference to Rome. Just as Babylon was the worst enemy of the people of Israel in the Old Testament, so Rome was to the early Christians. That phrase, she who is in Babylon, is a reference to the church. Let me read the last part of verse 14. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. A benediction. Peter's final words to the faithful Christians who are suffering so terribly are, peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let me make a couple of observations about those words. One is, the peace that Peter is referring to is not contingent on the circumstances of life. If it were, I think Peter is very insensitive, telling people who are suffering, peace, brother, peace, sister. No, Peter means every word. He means it from his heart. Peace to you. This peace is what Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 describes as peace that guards our hearts and transcends all circumstances. How can such peace exist in the midst of suffering? Well, it does. It does not in the form of circumstances that are, are going to change. It does. This peace exists because Christ lives in you. Christ lives in me. And Christ lived in the hearts of those people who read Peter's words. Second point or observation about peace to all of you who are in Christ. It's interesting to note that Peter extends this benediction to everyone who believes in Christ. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. It's not limited. It's not qualified. It's to everyone who believes in Jesus. This is so encouraging and so powerful to take in, especially if you're suffering, that this peace is available to me even when I'm feeling so down that I'm not sure I can make it to tomorrow. This peace is available to me. It exists in me even when my enemies surround me. This peace is so powerful. What a blessing it is. What does this passage look like, this verses 8 to 14, in terms of everyday life, life lessons? First of all, putting on a godly attitude, be sober-minded, be alert, be watchful, firm in your faith. Well, this is something that we must do each and every day. This putting on a godly attitude is not like I just finished my four-year degree and I'm done with that. No, this is something that we need to do each and every moment of our lives. Sometimes we, we may start off with this attitude of being sober-minded, 
being alert, being watchful, being firm in our faith. And then something will happen during the day and we get sidetracked and we lose focus. Well, those are the times when we need to remind ourselves of the importance of these attitudes that Peter commands us to have. Godly attitude meets real life. It's like going to the gym. You know, the phrase, no pain, no gain. Our attitudes are meant to grow. It's not something that we achieve and we go, good, I'm done. It's meant to grow and mature. Unlike weights in a gymnasium, our growth of our attitudes comes most often through suffering. Testing and suffering are the tools by which God crafts and builds our attitude to reflect godly character. I got to tell you, as a person who's gone through this process many, many times, it's tough. I'm not going to kid you. It's tough. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's not a train. As we go through this process, may I remind you, you're not going through it alone. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, walks with you. He cares. He knows what we're going through. As I finish my message, let me remind you of a couple of things that I shared this morning. One are the words of my friend, even as he's going through this terrible ordeal. My life is not futile. I know sometimes when we're suffering, we question whether our lives matter. Does it amount to anything, our struggle? Does anybody really care? Sometimes we feel so bad. We might even feel like that character in It's a Wonderful Life. I should have never been born. I've been there. I know what it's like. But remember that your life is not futile. My life is not futile. Sometimes we blow it. We're human beings. We make mistakes. We do things we wish we could go into a time machine and go back and undo them. No can do. But my friend's words have really ministered to me. My mistakes are not fatal. Not that it won't do harm, but it's not fatal. And you know why? Because God is sovereign. He's able to take even our mistakes and weave it into something beautiful that will glorify him. Finally, my death is not final. I remember Dr. Masokata. He shared with me a long time ago. He said, Fred, no matter what you do in life, no matter what you serve and how you serve, remember these words. Nobody gets out of this world alive. <laughs> he said it with a smile, and I know what he meant, that we have a shelf life. Unless Jesus comes again, all of us are going to eventually experience physical death. And sometimes as we get closer to that point, we may really feel bad about what we didn't do or what we did do. But remember, my death, your death, is not final. Finally, I leave you with the words in verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, 
and establish you. Amen. Father, we are so blessed to be your people. Forgive us when we complain about the circumstances of our lives. Forgive us of marginalizing Christ in us. Use whatever means are necessary to grow us, to mature our heart attitude so that we can glorify you no matter what the circumstances of life might be. I pray for my brothers and sisters, for those who are going through suffering now, may you encourage them. May your presence in their lives give them hope and empowerment. May you give them incentive to worship you even if they don't feel like it. And for us, the body of Christ, may we heed the words of Scripture where you tell us, weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Thank you, O Lord, for the suffering, the magnificent ways in which you use this tool to bless us, to cause us to grow. In the name of Jesus, amen. What good is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul? good is it to make a sweet sound but remain proud in view of God's mercy I offer my own and seek my let it be everything all of me here I am use me for your glory in everything I say and do let my life honor you here I am living for your glory
when the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Brothers and sisters, receive the benediction of the Lord. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.